Good morning and welcome. I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the lands which the Academy is broadcasting today. We also acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners and the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which the Academy operates and its fellows live and work. And from wherever you are today and wherever you're joining us from, they hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. My name is Anna Maria Arabia and I'm the Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science and your MC this morning. Today, we celebrate the recipients of this year's Prime Minister's Prizes for Science, supported by the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. We come to you live from the iconic Shine Dome in Canberra, where we would have traditionally hosted a breakfast to celebrate the prize recipients. But this year we celebrate differently and we invite the world to join us. And soon we will cross live to the prize recipients so we can all get to know them a little more. I hope you have some morning tea in hand or perhaps some bubbles to salute extraordinary scientists and teachers who help shape our nation and help shape our future. I would now like to welcome the President of the Australian Academy of Science, Professor John Shine. Thank you, Anna Maria. Good morning to everyone joining us. As Anna Maria mentioned, this year's event clearly looks a little different, but in some ways it's even better because we are now enabling the participation of all Australians and indeed people from around the world to celebrate these outstanding scientific achievements. Our warmest congratulations to the recipients of all the prizes announced last night and our deepest gratitude for the work you do every day to advance science in Australia, for Australia and as part of a global research enterprise. Whilst all of the Prime Minister's prize recipients are absolutely exceptional, I would like to applaud the Academy Fellows who are recipients this year. The recipients of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science, Emeritus Professor David Blair, Professor David McClellan, Professor Susan Scott, and Professor Peter Veach. With David, David and Susan being fellows of this Academy. And of course, I would also like to congratulate the recipient of the Prime Minister's Prize for Innovation, Academy Fellow, Professor Thomas Mushmeyer. It is always wonderful to celebrate science. And it is, of course, part of the Australian Academy of Sciences DNA to champion and support excellence in Australian science, as well as to provide independent scientific advice, promote international scientific engagement, and big, build public awareness and the importance of understanding of science. Tuning in this morning are fellows, teachers, students, policy makers, parliamentarians, agency and association leaders, journalists, academy partners and sponsors, and many members of the public who I know are equally excited and inspired by the work of these scientists. I know that the recipients of the 2020 Prime Minister's Prizes for Science also share our commitment to scientific excellence. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, the Honourable Karen Andrews. Well, good morning and a very big welcome to everyone at the, to the Prime Minister's Prizes for Science after party. Now, normally we would be at the Shine Dome and there may well be one or two people that would have hangovers. That may or may not be the case um, today, but we're here to celebrate the great achievements of our, our scientists and those in particular that uh, were recipients last night. So a big congratulations, a big shout out. I really did miss the opportunity to celebrate all things great about science last night and again uh, this morning, but doing this virtually, quite frankly, may well be a bit of the way of the future, but it's still a great opportunity for us to celebrate the fantastic work that the science community offers to us. So well done, congratulations, enjoy breakfast. Thank you, Minister Andrews. As one of the recipients of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science puts it, this is a perfect story for science. Four collaborators from across the country, 
working together for decades to achieve a world first breakthrough that has ushered in a new era of astrophysics. Take a look. Gravitational waves have helped unlock mysteries of the universe. First predicted by Albert Einstein, we weren't sure they actually existed until 2015. We have detected gravitational waves. We did it. It had been a 100 year journey to get from when Einstein predicted the waves to when we actually detected them and we needed every moment in between for technology development and developing the science. At the heart of that development were four Australians who are this year's joint recipients of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science. David Blair from the University of Western Australia, David McClelland and Susan Scott from the Australian National University and Peter Veach from the University of Adelaide. I think we'd, we'd been working on it for so long that everybody was just hanging out for, for the detection. The signal detected in 2015 came from the collision of two massive black holes 1.3 billion years ago. There is no other way to observe that other than in the gravitational waves they emit. It's a perfect story for science. But observing them required the most precise measuring device ever built, known as LIGO in the United States. Some of the control measures used by LIGO were first developed in the Australian outback by David Blair and his team. And we discovered a phenomena that would stop these detectors from working. And it was a, a, a big undertaking, in fact. It took more than 12 PhD projects to finally uh, get this all pinned down and work out ways to prevent this from happening. Peter Veach and his team in Adelaide developed sensors that prevent residual absorption, distorting LIGO's vital laser beam. We could see the sensitivity of the detector becoming better and better, but I have to say that the uh, detection happened more easily than we were expecting. It was a great reward after so much effort. David McClellan's ANU team helped design and install LIGO's main control system, while also building hardware for precise routing of the laser beam. It's fantastic now when I think about it to know that Australian technology and Australian materials and equipment sit inside these enormous detectors in the USA recording these signals. Susan Scott, regarded as Australia's leading general relativity theorist, helped design LIGO's data analysis system. In 1998, I initiated the Australian effort in gravitational wave data analysis and led the Australian effort in digging gravitational wave signals out of noisy detector data. All four winners say the Prime Minister's Prize is good recognition, not just of the collaborative nature of science, but the contribution Australia makes on the world stage. In Australia alone, we spent more than 40 years developing detectors and technologies for detecting these waves. Our combined work and expertise has meant that Australia now has a, a full coverage of all elements of the gravitational wave detection project. The Australian Academy of Science, because questions need answers. It's my great honour today to be joined by the four joint recipients of the 2020 Prime Minister's Prize for Science, Professors David Blair, David McClellan, Susan Scott and Peter Veach. Hello to you all and my warmest congratulations. Susan Scott, give us a sense of how this team's work has fundamentally changed the study of our universe. Well, it's really quite simple. Um, throughout humanity's history, we've been looking out into the universe using light with our eyes and telescopes, and also radio waves with uh, radio telescopes. But with the detection of gravitational waves in 2015, we detected an entirely new signal that is produced by the universe. And with that new type of signal, we can unlock vast areas of the universe that we just can't see with things like light and radio waves, like a, a very big population of black holes. Um, and we learn things about their lives and attributes. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, David Blair, you're in Western Australia. Peter's based in Adelaide and David McClellan and Susan are based in Canberra. 
But David, how closely have you worked together over the years? Well, uh, very, very, very closely. Um, Peter was my third PhD student. Uh, he helped build the first gravitational wave detector. In fact, I did a very large part of it, um, a resonant bar detector, which is now in a sort of museum at our Gravity Discovery Center. Um, and uh, uh, we learnt about precise measurements and uh, uh, um, and then, and then uh, uh, David McClellan's group um, contacted us, said, let's work together towards these laser detectors. And, uh, um, uh, and I guess from then on, we were all working together. We formed an um, a, 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 a Australian consortium uh, where we all focused our efforts on a national effort for gravitational waves. True collaboration right there. Peter Beach, we've just learned that you were once David Blair's PhD student. So this has been quite the journey. Certainly has. Uh, as David said, I was his third PhD student. I started my PhD with him back in 1979. It's a long time ago now. It's hard to imagine. And uh, so I worked with that, as David said, on a, a different type of technology for develop, measuring gravitational waves. And it's nice to hear that it it's not been completely been, but it sits in a museum somewhere. It's about where it should be. But then we decided that we were going to move in the direction of the laser-based detectors, the modern type of detector. And so I moved to the University of Glasgow for a sort of embryonic British UWA collaboration in this area. And I worked there for a while with some very good people. And then I was fortunate enough to come back to the University of Adelaide and um, we just kept pushing ahead. It's always been a, an Australian wide collaboration. And that's, you know, and it's a reflection of the enormous collaboration around the world that has been required to basically develop the best detectors ever. And it has been a, a big effort. Over 40 years, it's hard to think it's been so long. It's phenomenal and it does remind us of how critical international collaboration is to science and to mm. research. Uh, David McClelland, you mentioned in the story that Australian hardware and expertise contributed to the success of LIGO. Talk me through how Australia got involved in the first place. Well, as David Blair mentioned, we formed this consortium in Australia, which we call a Kiga on the East Coast and a Seager on the West Coast. And so we never quite sorted that naming out. But, but that was about 1995. And that was between Adelaide, UWA and ANU. And at that time, the University of Melbourne joined. So our goal was to work towards technology for gravitational wave detection. In 96 then, I was a sabbatical in Caltech and Barry Barish, the then LIGO director, decided to form the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. That was to bring researchers around the world who are interested in LIGO science to work on technologies and analysis. Akiga was founding member of that collaboration. For the next 10 years, we worked on various aspects of control systems of distortions, instabilities and analysis, whilst LIGO built the first generation of detector. That first generation of detector worked well, but it didn't detect gravitational waves. So we needed to build an advanced detector. We needed to upgrade that system. LIGO looked, needed extra expertise. They turned to Australia and said, would you like to be partners? We approached the Australian Research Council in 2009. We were funded by them to become full partners at Advanced LIGO and we are still funded through the ARC for that purpose. And the rest is history. Fantastic, and thank you to that government support. It's been critical. Uh, David Blair, we saw from the story mm. some of the early setbacks you had, to over, you had to overcome. Did you encounter doubt along the way? You know, was it perhaps just too challenging to detect gra gravitational waves? How did you get through that? No, I never doubted, and I think none of our team doubted that we would uh, ever uh, that we would get there in the end. But uh, many people around us doubted us, and uh, the, there used to be a joke that gravitational wave detection was always ten years in the future. <laughs> uh, so we had to we had to deal with that, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, and. Uh, I think at the time of detection, we were really, uh, really expecting that we were going to detect something. But 
at the same time, what we detected was a surprise because we never expected such huge black holes and uh, never expected a signal as strong as the one that we first saw. Mm. But Peter Beach, um, give me a sense of how things changed after 2015. A lot of global headlines, a lot of new interest was uh, there, a sense of new energy within the field. What was that like? Um, it was amazing. So, as David was saying, we, we moved from an, um, an operation where we were solving an, we were on an endless quest to solve problems and we had an enormous amount of faith that we would eventually detect something. But, you know, it was almost a standing joke in the, in the international community to one where we had an unambiguous detection. It was just so big. You know, it could not be explained on some sort of mistake with the computer or whatever. It was just enormous. And now we're in a situation where gravitational wave detection and science and astrophysics is now well established, well accepted, and everybody is looking forward to even more detections. And this has completely transformed the community. And once again, the ASC has come to, come is helping us with the um, award of the OSGRAV, the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. And that has allowed the Australian effort to grow. It, it, it really is a big growth phase. And you can see the excitement in the faces of the students that, were, that are part of, this, part of this effort. And it's just great to see this, this happening after so many years. That's such an important point, inspiring the next generation. That's exactly what it's all about. And uh, to continue that wonderful rich pipeline of uh, STEM students and STEM professionals for Australia and keep us leading in this area. Uh, Susan Scott, to you, what has been the most outstanding discovery since we've started to detect gravitational waves? And if there was one great unknown you think gravitational waves may one day help us solve, what is it? Well, obviously the first detection to actually detect two black holes, a system we'd never seen before, was really, you know, revolutionary. It was amazing. But I think for me personally, in 2017, detection of two neutron stars colliding was um, a big deal because it meant that we had other signals uh, from the event and we found that it was, in fact, the source of these high-energy gamma-ray bursts that we'd been observing daily for 50 years. So that was a, a huge uh, revelation. Uh, but also we found that they were the production factories of heavy elements in the universe like gold, platinum and uranium. So that was for me a very, very big deal and brought in all the astronomers worldwide. Looking ahead, I think we really want to further probe the nature of neutron stars, the densest stars in the universe. We want to understand a lot more about how supernovae explode. We entirely expect to be surprised and find things that uh, we as yet don't know about. And finally, I think we want to use gravitational waves to look back to the very beginning of the universe at the Big Bang. And it feels like we're just at the beginning. How very exciting. So a final question for all, all of you. Um, can you explain to me what receiving the Prime Minister's Prize for Science means? Susan, you first. Well, it's obviously a great honour and it's, it's very thrilling for us personally as a team, but also for all the people we work with in Australia, our research teams and OSRAB. Um, it's also very satisfying after such a long journey that we did achieve that goal that we'd all been aspiring to for so long. And finally, I'd like to say that, you know, in a field that traditionally has had very few senior women, uh, I'd like to try to be... Uh, a role model and you know inspire young people and especially young women to think about having careers in physical sciences where they can make a very valuable and important contribution and uh, we do need you you've certainly inspired us susan thank you david blair what does it mean to you well um <clears throat> i think we <clears throat> the first thing is i, th I think this is a, a recognition of how, how physics works and how important physics is uh, today. Um, some people think of uh, physics as being all finished, but it, it clearly is not. We are, we are still in a, a, at a, uh, in a wave of discovery. We've just built the 
you know, the first gravity radios, which are a bit like, uh, you know, the first radios uh, built by uh, Marconi, you know, um, a century ago. And uh, we've got a long, long way to go with this technology. There's all, all sorts of revelations that I suspect we haven't even thought of. So we're at a front, an exciting frontier and, uh, and it's so important for, uh, for people to understand and, and uh, see that we are in, the, uh, in this wave of discovery. Thank you. David McClellan, how do you feel about the prize? Yes, yeah, so I echo what David had to say. We're, we're at the beginning. This is a discovery which has launched a field rather than the end of a field. And what we're going to discover, we can't, can only imagine. But it's also a technology development where some of the technologies that have come from the focus on fundamental physics has been converted into practical applications. And I think there are many more of those to happen as well. But what I'm most excited about is the possibility that sometime in the future, Australia might be able to build one of these magnificent machines uh, on our home, home turf. Absolutely. Uh, Peter Beach, did you ever expect a recognition like this? Um, certainly not. Uh, one dreams of this type of recognition. It's, it's a validation of a lifetime of work and it's far from obvious during the journey that this is actually going to work out. As I mentioned before, there was a not insubstantial amount of faith required along the way. And so to actually have this recognition, and it's important that it's recognition by Australia, that Australia has made an important contribution to this large international project. And I think that's it's a good message for Australia. It's a good message for students um, that they sh that there's a lot of excitement, a lot of activity in this area. There's a lot of advanced technology that we're in the middle of developing. And come and join us. We need you. Thank you. And it's absolute testament to the quality of Australian research. Thank you uh, to you all for being here and congratulations once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three of the recipients of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science are fellows of the Australian Academy of Science. And another fellow is this year's recipient of the Prime Minister's Prize for Innovation. 300 million tonnes of plastic is produced globally each year, according to a report by the World Wildlife Fund. Some of that waste ends up in our oceans endangering wildlife. Professor Thomas Mushmeyer developed a catalytic thermal reactor known as CAT-HTR. It can recycle mixed plastics and turn them into smaller hydrocarbon components that can be used to produce sustainable chem chemicals and fuel. Professor Mushmeyer also built the Jellion platform using low cost zinc bromide battery technology to store renewable energy in a scalable way. Professor Mushmeyer joins us now. Good morning and our warmest congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Great How to be on here. Yep. Thank you for being with us. How do you begin developing the technology that has led to this plastic recycling platform? Well, it's a long journey. Initially, we looked at brown coal to help the brown coal transition, um, but I think that is not really of these, of these times anymore. So we really focused on changing organic matter, and that is uh, both uh, uh, organic waste, uh, so pulp and paper waste or construction waste, and then we were able to tune it also to plastics. So that was really done in response to China's announcement a few years ago that they will change the way in which they are um, importing plastic waste from the rest of the world. And then, of course, the rest of Southeast Asia followed. So there was an opportunity to retune our process uh, to deal with the plastic and it's doing so very successfully. Absolutely fantastic and so needed. Uh, can you help us understand um, simply how it works? Sure. So um, basically, we have what we call a soft and a hard set of conditions. The soft set of conditions, it's uh, selectively opening carbon oxygen bonds. So that is when we process biomass. So to get renewable feedstocks for the petrochemical industry. Um, the hard conditions are about cracking carbon carbon bonds. So we, we are in a different processing regime. In both cases, this, the, the critical, supercritical water or near critical water, so that is gaseous water that is so compressed that it becomes almost again like a liquid. It's able to dissolve things. 
And that water is not just a heat transfer agent and a mass transfer agent, it also is a reactive medium and donates its hydrogen into our products. And therefore, we don't need hydrogen gas, which then changes the economics dramatically. Amazing. Uh, how scalable is the CAT HTR? Could it recycle much of the 300 million tonnes of plastic produced each year? Yes. Um, so, so I think in terms of plastic recycling, there are a number of uh, answers. There's, of course, our process. Then there's mechanical recycling, which would be the go-to uh, initially. And then we take the rest. And we can't, can't take quite all of the rest. So I would think 50% CAT HDR, 25% mechanical recycling, and 25% waste to energy is where it's going to go. And we are rolling these plants out around the world, uh, in Germany, in the UK, in Canada. We're starting to do this in Australia as well. So we very much think that about 50% of the plastic is suitable for our, uh, for our process. Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, your innovations don't stop there. Uh, you have a platform to store sustainable energy. How does one innovation complement the other? Well, all of my work really has been about sustainability and to some degree reducing CO2 emissions. And the batteries are part of that. So it is they allow to, uh, to take renewable energy off grid um, uh, in, in tough environments. So in agriculture um, and remote areas and marginal lands. So we're focusing on solar battery solutions for desalination, for irrigation, for water shifting. And in those environments, other batteries just don't survive. We are very robust. We are what's called abuse tolerant. So we can be charged to 100%, discharged to 0%, no problem at all. And we don't have uh, much fade at all compared to lead acid or, or lithium ion, which will die very, very quickly. So that enables us to bring renewable energy into these kind of uh, situations. And from there, our volume will become bigger and bigger. And then we will end up finally in solar, solar farms, etc. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, tell us, Thomas, where would you like to take your research next? Yeah, so uh, of course I've done these two things and, and they work well, so we are commercializing them and uh, there are commercial people now looking after this more and more. I'll just make sure that the technology works. So the next two things I'm really excited about is one, the electrocatalytic conversion of nitrogen into ammonia, um, just basically using humid air. Uh, and the other is uh, lithium sulfur batteries where we've developed a uh, additive that really helps uh, with some of the fundamental problems in lithium sulfur. And of course, lithium sulfur batteries are very energy dense uh, and they would be suitable for, uh, for drones and various aviation uh, applications, as well as cars, of course. Watch this space. It's absolutely phenomenal and all strength to you. Professor Mushmeyer, thank you for your time. Thank and you very now, much. Over to you, President, Professor John Shine, to congratulate the recipients of the other awards presented yesterday evening. Thank you, Anna Maria. I would firstly like to congratulate the recipient of the 2020 Malcolm McIntosh Prize for Physical Scientist of the Year, Scienta Associate Professor Xiao Jing Hao from the University of New South Wales for developing novel thin film solar cells using a family of materials called castorites. Congratulations to Professor Mark Dawson from the Peter McCallum Cancer Center, who was awarded the Frank Fenner Prize for Life Scientist of the Year for his world leading research in translational medicine and clinical trials in cancer therapeutics. The prize for new innovators was awarded to Associate Professor Justin Chalker from Flinders University for developing polymer materials with direct implications for global sustainability. Congratulations, Justin. The Prime Minister's Prize for Excellence in Science Teaching in Secondary Schools was awarded to Mr. Darren Hamley from Willerton Senior High Secondary School in Western Australia for his passionate, dedicated and innovation, innovative teaching of science and the inspiration he provides students through real world applications of science theory and the Prime Minister's Prize for Excellence in Science Teaching in Primary Schools was awarded to Mrs. Sarah Fletcher from Bonython Primary School in the ACT for being an exceptional STEM specialist teacher who provides quality learning for students and supports colleagues. 
And with the Academy's history and dedication to STEM teaching across Australia, we congratulate also the highly commended teachers for 2020. Firstly, Mrs. Megan Hayes from Mudrabar Creek State School in Queensland, highly commended for inspiring students to think critically, take risks, and develop 21st century skills as the leaders of the future. Congratulations to Mr. Stuart Garth from Redeemer Baptist School in New South Wales. Highly commended for being an outstanding STEM teacher who has mentored hundreds of students across New South Wales in scientific innovations. And finally, congratulations to Mr. Stephen Harrison from Huonville High School in Tasmania. Highly commended for being an outstanding educator who by establishing a sea urchin hatchery for teaching purposes, has created a real world learning for students. So congratulations to you all. Thank you for so richly enhancing STEM education across Australia for the next generation. Finally, our warmest congratulations and thanks to each of the schools that you hail from. We know that creating a STEM education rich environment requires commitment and leadership from the principal and the broader school environment. You are all truly an inspiration to us. So back to you, Anna Maria. Thank you, John. And congratulations to all the 2020 recipients of the Prime Minister's Prizes for Science. Thank you again to the recipients who joined us live here at the Shine Dome this morning and to those who are joining us from around Australia. A special thanks to the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources for your support of this event and for all the hard work you put in year after year to attract a diverse pool of candidates. We have missed seeing you in person over the course of 2020 and look forward to our ongoing collaborations. That brings us to the end of today's event. Thank you to everyone online, wherever you are in Australia or around the world. I'm Anna Maria Arabia. Have a wonderful day.